When we look at a website, what are we seeing? There's photos, there's graphics, there's text. There might be a button that says contact or buy now. How did it get there? How did we get to what the web is today from where it started? So I've actually been doing computers all my life. I started, I had a VIC-20, that was my first computer back when I was five years old. Uh, I learned how to program, turn it on. You would actually have a pro, you could program it right away. You turn it on, there's no programs required, you could just program. And as technology got more and more, um, I, I guess, sophisticated, what was actually happening was that computers ended up being able to do more with it. You could do more with the computer. So by the time I got a Commodore 64, that was the next version up, there was modems. And modems are, stand for modulation, demodulation devices. And we all know them, 56K modems, the little whistling sound that it made when it dialed up. Back in my days, when I first got it, mine was at, so everyone else's uh, modems, they were probably at 56,000 baud, 56K. My modem was 300 baud. So I could literally type faster than it. Um, and it was actually really cool though, because what it ultimately let me do, a modem would let me dial up to some other computer somewhere else in the city, typically. Uh, long distance was expensive back then. And you would actually dial up and you could actually communicate with somebody. So at, his, at our core, we're humans, we want to communicate. And what do we do? We have a computer, which, you know, as Rob actually was saying, computers and social networks that kind of isolate us. Here we are, hobbyists, have these computers, and suddenly we go, well, what are we gonna do with this? And this is 30 years ago, right? We communicate. So as we move along, um, BBSs became more and more sophisticated. BBSs are what you, we would dial into, that's what it was called. BBS would stand for Bulletin Board System. And they were just run by hobbyists. I ran a Bulletin Board System as a kid, Lots of other people did too. And you would dial up, and as these things got more sophisticated, people suddenly wanted to have more phone lines. So one phone line meant one person on at a time. Uh, what would happen was that um, as people got more and more into this thing, um, BBSs turned from asynchronous communication, where one person was on the computer at once, to something synchronous, where multiple people can communicate at the same time. And this is literally how this is the beginnings of what we would call now sort of interconnected computers. It still wasn't the internet. Internet actually started, I don't know if a lot of you realize this, internet actually started as a military project. Back in the 60s, we created something called ARPANET. At ARPANET, what that actually was, was the military's attempt to create a self-healing, self-routing network that would survive attack. So you'd suddenly have this computer system where you could actually go ahead, take nodes off the network, and still be able to find other computers that are on the network and communicate with them, Send, sending them electronic mail, sharing, sharing files. And that was something very new. So we now have these BBSs spreading all over the country, and we have what was the ARPANET back then. And really the two ha didn't come together for a while yet. So we still had to go through all the iteration of figuring out how to make this ultimately asynchronous communication into something more synchronous. And what, what happened was BBSs turned from something that was a hobbyist uh, thing that you would do with your own computer into something that was more commercial. So companies like CompuServe and AOL came on the scene. And again, we went from one, one phone line to two phone lines to, you know, at AOL and CompuServe, we had many hundreds of phone lines. And each one of these phone lines represented a person. And each step along the way built on what happened in the past. So we didn't wake up one day and say, oh my goodness, here's the internet. Yeah. What, what was happening is that the hobbyists and people that were involved in computers were taking little baby steps along the way to make something more and more interesting for communication to get us more interconnected. So how did, so the title of the talk really, I, you know, how a misspelled word created the web, and that's what's actually very interesting. So back in uh, 1991, um, the internet was still fledgling. 
And that's sort of the start of the original internet itself, where it became more commercial, uh, where you could actually get onto the internet. But it was still ultimately limited mostly to higher education institutions. So universities, if you're a university student, you're a professor, you would probably have, a, have an account on the school's mainframe computer, the Unix system that would be connected to the internet. And as a result, what you wanted to do, and your point of using the internet, was not to surf around, because the, web's, the web didn't exist really then. What your point was, was to share information. You had created a document, you had created a paper, you want to show that to somebody, you want to share that information. And at the time, what we really had was a couple ways to share that information. And one of them was publishing in a journal. Well, journals only came out once every month. But if you had something really new and you wanted to share that information, what could we do? And ultimately, what we ended up doing is creating something called Gopher. And Gopher was a precursor to what we know as the web. And Gopher, if you can imagine a file structure on your computer where you have multiple directories and each directory has different files inside of it, text files, that's the structure of Gopher. And what Gopher would let you do is, using search engines at the time, Archie, Jughead, this is for real, uh, you would actually be able to find your resource. So you could look something up. But what wasn't there, and what was, which we won't see until we actually hit the World Wide Web, what we know now as the internet, is there was nothing that would link one document to the next. Again, that sort of crucial piece of communication went away. It wasn't there yet, I should say. So Gopher, if Gopher was a way to index specific documents in the same way that a library and a library catalog system would index books, the World Wide Web, which came next, is what allowed us to actually link information together, have hypertext. Those are all those links that you see on a website. I'm going to click that link. Click here. Click this button to buy something. Contact me. Those, that's something new and different that the World Wide Web, or as us geeks say it, the hyper um, ultimately what it was based on was a protocol called the Hypertext Transmission Protocol, or HTTP. That's the funny stuff you type at the beginning of a web address. Okay. It actually means something, amazingly. So where does this whole misspelling come in? The misspelling is when we were first creating HTTP, the actual transmission protocol that websites use today, there's a spelling mistake. Okay, one, of, one of the words, refer, they spelt it with one R, not two. Why does this matter? Right? It's one word, change it. Well, there's a couple of problems. One, we can't change the word. It's entrenched. Every web browser, every web server, all of the programs that analyze the logs, all the programs that look for error logs, uh, access logs, they're all, every single one of them, keyed to that error, that mistaken word. But what it shows us in actually realizing that there is a mistake, there is a mistake that is carried through the entire time of the web. And the, from 1991, when the web, when the WWW, the World Wide Web, or the Hypertext Transmission Protocol, first became alive, the genesis, all the way through now, so 10 years later, we still have the mistake, it's showing us, I'm sorry, 20 years later, whoops, 20 years <laughs> later, we still have a mistake. Um, it shows us that things are built on the past. Things don't change on computers as quickly as you think they do. So one of the things, you know, I, I talk to people about this sometimes, and one of the things that I tell people is, look at a computer, the, mo the coolest, most amazing MacBook Pro you can imagine, and you go, oh my God, it's beautiful. There's aluminum, it's fast, it's got to be all new. And in fact, it's not. So even the... The MacBook Pros, the brand new MacBook Pros, the iPads, they all have as foundational to them stuff that is 20, 30, 40, 50 years old inside. And there's a really good way that we can prove this. If you actually buy, you can buy these, I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember their colleges having these VT220 terminals. They look like screens with a keyboard attached. And that was it. Okay? These things are like 20, 30 years old. And they do something called it's a terminal. Okay? These are dumb terminals. They're serial terminals. And you can actually take one of them and hook it to your brand new bought last week MacBook Pro. And you can actually emulate a terminal. Now, I use the word emulation. I'm not quite accurate with that. 
It's not actually emulating. It's actually being an actual Unix terminal. So here we have proof that we have this 30-year-old this technology that can connect to something that's days old. And they are literally talking in a language that we really haven't used for 30 years. Now, why is that there? Because whenever we're talking about anything from computers to communication to the way we interact, things take time to change. We don't overnight recreate a, an operating system. Okay? Mac OS, Lion just came out. Lion, if you're not using, if you're Windows, I mean Windows 7, if you're a Mac person, you probably know about Lion. Lion is this new operating system. It's new, but it still is, has its past 10 years ago when the first Mac OS 10 came out, and it's actually rooted even further in history with something called BSD. So why does this all matter? Why, why am I standing up here telling you all about you know, misspelled words and why computers are really older than you think? Because ultimately, what this all comes down to is that what computers are letting us do and what websites are letting us do is present information in a way, in, in a new novel way, but still with a foundation to the past. So when you look at a website and you see the buy now button, you see the contact button, what we're actually doing, we're building on 40, 50 years worth of how to do this. And it's going to continue to evolve. And you're going to see, just like five years ago when we had MySpace on the scene, and there was blinking lights all over the place in the, on, on your website, and there was grotesque colors, and then we realized, oh, wait, that's not a good way to introduce content. We realized we started looking more and more towards the design. And right now, where we are on the web is it's gotten outside of the hobbyists. We've gotten beyond the, you know, the geeks in the closet working on you know, the web, working on computers, working on little programs at home. We've gotten now into the age of we have the foundation, now we're designing it. And we're creating something that's beautiful to look at, beautiful to, look at, to work with. And where we're going to go in the future is, I think, probably more of that. So um, ultimately, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so basically what's going on with this is that you will see more and more of the design aspects. And you will see, and one of the things you're seeing when you look at a website is that every element on the page has a purpose. And each one of those elements, that purpose is to do something for you, um, to elicit a response. And it's actually very interesting to see all the way back to its humble beginnings of literally dial-up modems and computers being run by hobbyists. And now look where we are today. Thank you.